Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday webinar. Uh, as some of you may already know, Birkett Long continues to offer a series of bi-weekly webinars on a, a range of different topics uh, for individuals, families and businesses. And uh, today we're going to be looking at the subject of director's duties in the twilight zone. Now, I presented on this subject uh, last year. Um, everything I spoke about is very much uh, still relevant and very important uh, today. Um, so I'm hoping that this will be a useful reminder, a bit of a refresher for those of you who perhaps joined us last time or uh, an insight for those of you um, who weren't able to. Um, I will be touching on a couple of uh, aspects um, of legislative changes in the past 12 months that relate uh, to this particular topic. And uh, um, I'll be touching a little bit later on um, the potential for the personal liability in relation to the misuse of bounce back loans, which, of course, is a, a very much a, a feature uh, of, of the pandemic. So um, before I go any further, for the benefit of those who uh, don't know me, um, I'm a partner at Burkitt Long uh, specialising in insolvency work, uh, and that's particularly contentious uh, insolvency work. And I've been doing that now for uh, over 20 years. Uh, I typically act for insolvency practitioners bringing claims uh, against directors, uh, but I also act for directors defending such claims. And I find that having that experience uh, of working on both sides uh, of the fence can be uh, very useful uh, in any uh, given case. Um, I've got a particular interest uh, in uh, and experience of advising and defending directors facing uh, disqualification proceedings, and that's something which I'll touch upon towards the end of the presentation. Now, no legal webinar would be complete without a disclaimer uh, currently shown on your screens. So moving on, uh, the title of the presentation talks about director duties in the twilight zone. And I pose the question, what is the twilight zone? And I've turned this into a very short multiple choice quiz. Um, so uh, what is the twilight zone? Is it A, an American fantasy TV series broadcast between 1959 and 1964? in which, and I'm going to have to quote from Wikipedia here, uh, characters find themselves dealing with often disturbing or unusual events, often with a surprise ending and a moral. Uh, is it B, a 1992 number two hit for the Dutch pop rave giants 2 Unlimited? Or is it C, the period in a company's life when it is or is likely to become insolvent and its recovery prospects are uncertain? Well, the answer, of course, is all three, uh, but sadly, again, for fans of Two Unlimited, I'll only be focusing on the third scenario in today's presentation. In terms of the agenda, then, uh, what I'll be looking at this afternoon is four main areas of the subject. So we'll be kicking off shortly with looking at what the director's duties are and where they come from. Uh, I'll then be looking at what potential liabilities directors could face if they breach those duties. Um, uh, then I'll be giving some practical tips uh, that directors can take uh, take on board with a view to discharging their duties and uh, minimising potential liability. And then finally, the, the scary bit, if you like, at the end, um, what could uh, potentially happen if a director failed to discharge their, their duties? Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A chat function. We'll have a look at them at the end of the presentation. Indeed, I'm very happy to speak to anyone um, by email uh, by email or by telephone uh, after the webinar is over. I do appreciate the subject is kind of sensitive. So um, let's just set the scene first of all. And I, I just put the question there on the slide. Why is the subject important? Well, I, I think there's four reasons. Um, first of all, um, directors of limited companies uh, can usually take comfort from the fact that the that their liability is limited, uh, hence the word limited in the title of the company. Uh, however, many directors don't realise that in certain circumstances, as I'll be explaining, um, they can incur personal liability. So that means that an, in the case of an administration or a liquidation, the insolvency practitioner can take action against uh, an offending director in, in the pursuit of a greater recovery for the benefit of the, of the company's creditors. So that's, that's the first reason, action by office holders. Um, secondly, uh, disqualification proceedings could also be brought, which uh, might have a significant impact on the individual's professional life, uh, as well as uh, in turn their, their personal life. And if you think about it, it could spill even further to, to others, so employees perhaps of a successor business that they're now involved in. 
The third reason I think this is an important topic is because if you get it very wrong, uh, in very serious cases, then criminal proceedings uh, can even be brought. And then finally, uh, the pandemic, COVID. Um, coming into the, the start of the pandemic last year, UK businesses were already in an extended period of uncertainty uh, due to Brexit, basically, um, with corporate insolvencies at their highest level since 2014. And then, of course, suddenly, bang, the coronavirus outbreak uh, hits the UK uh, in, in what, the early part of March of last year. Now, it's fair to say that the government's intervention with the assorted financial packages, such as furloughing, uh, bounce back loans, the deferment of tax, etc. Those initiatives, they've helped many businesses uh, in the past 18 months to weather the storm of the pandemic uh, with varying degrees of success, of course. Um, and then there was some legislation um, last year that was introduced that specifically brought in uh, restrictions placed on the ability of creditors to take certain uh, enforcement action uh, where monies uh, were owed to them. And that's prevented what would otherwise almost certainly have been uh, a huge number of insolvencies last year, which would still be going on to this very day as a result of the pandemic. So that's the position it's been thus far, but I'm going to suggest that that's going to start to change in the coming months or so um, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, many of the financial supports uh, that I mentioned a moment ago have, have tapered off. Uh, some have already ceased um, and some of those deferred liabilities are going to start to be uh, crystallised and, and be called in. Um, and the second reason is that from the 1st of October, so next month, you know, in a, what, uh, just over a week's time, some of the restrictions that I alluded to uh, earlier will no longer apply um, and instead will be replaced by uh, more limited uh, restrictions through till the 31st of March of next year, uh, unless that deadline gets pushed back further. Um, and, and I think that's going to make enforcement activity greater. Um, and the combination of those two reasons then, uh, I think means that we're going to see more businesses failing in the coming six months or so. So, as I say, this subject has particular relevance uh, at the moment because we are going to expect to see a large number of businesses um, teetering on the brink of insolvency in the coming months if they if they aren't already. So directors need to be careful uh, and consider carefully how the risks associated with the pandemic um, impact on their duties when they're making those decisions. Uh, and I would say quite often those decisions are made um, at a rapid pace under uh, extreme pressure. So let's start then uh, on, on the real substance of the presentation, which is the director's duties themselves. Where do they come from? Well, I'm going to be talking about those under the Companies Act 2006, um, because that Act of Parliament um, codified most, um, not all of them, but most of the duties that are imposed on directors um, by virtue of case law and equitable principles. And I'm going to be focusing on those in this presentation. Um, so on your screen at the moment, you'll see the seven general duties, um, sections 171 through to 177 of the Act. And um, I'm not going to read them out, but you can see for yourselves. But the three I want to draw to your attention are highlighted in red. And they are the ones that are particularly relevant to companies in financial difficulties. And I'd also draw your attention to the second duty under section 172, the duty to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members uh, as a whole. Um, this duty applies to all decisions that are made by a director, uh, not only those formal decisions that are approved by the board. So they do apply to informal decisions as well. Now, when a company is in, in happier times, when it's solvent, uh, these duties are owed to the company. So the, the interests of the shareholders uh, should drive managerial considerations. However, when we get into the twilight zone, those duties shift and they start to be owed to the company's creditors. Um, as I say, the twilight zone, giving it a bit of a definition at this point then. So it's the point at which the directors know or should have known that the company 
is or is likely to become insolvent, um, where, where likely is defined as meaning probable and where recovery prospects are uncertain. I'll just say that again. So it's the point at which the directors know or should know that the company is or is likely, likely being probable, to become insolvent and where recovery prospects are uncertain. So that's that's the definition of what I would dub the, the, the twilight zone. And just to give you, uh, and you can see them on the screen now, some of the, the indicators that a director should be aware of um, where, where a company is perhaps teetering on the brink of insolvency um, are those five bullet points um, shown um, on the slide right now. So company accounts obviously exceeding assets, show, sorry, so showing liabilities exceeding assets. Um, if there's legal action against the company, perhaps some CCJs, judgments have already been obtained for unpaid sums, um, failure to meet sales and cash flow forecasts and targets. Banks, of course, calling in um, overdrafts or refusing to extend overdrafts and suppliers refusing to make deliveries um, or provide services until outstanding invoices are settled. Um, those are sort of all the hallmarks, the badges of a company that's starting to experience or perhaps already is experiencing uh, financial distress. Now, it's a common misunderstanding that it's illegal to trade whilst insolvent. In fact, it's not. Uh, a company may uh, trade out of its financial problems. Um, but conversely, a company uh, may subsequently enter an insolvency process such as administration or liquidation. And uh, it's at this point that I um, introduce uh, an analogy that was taught to me in the early stages of my career. It's one that actually relates to wrongful trading, which I'll be talking about shortly. But as we'll see, uh, wrongful trading is one of the risks that a director can face during this period of a company's life. So I'd say you know, this analogy, I think, fits quite neatly the experience of trading in the twilight zone. And the, the analogy is this. The company is on a train track. It's going through a tunnel. There's a bright light ahead. Is it light at the end of the tunnel, salvation for the company, or is it in fact an oncoming train, liquidation or administration? And it's therefore during the twilight zone that the conduct of its directors, and that's both past ones and present ones, will subsequently be scrutinized um, if corporate failure then ensues. Uh, directors are potentially at their most vulnerable and exposed during this chapter of a company's life. So what does this uh, all mean? Well, it means that directors must consider at all times whether their duties have switched from being owed to the company, i.e. shareholders, to now being owed to the creditors. Uh, and therefore, they need to be very mindful of the personal risks which that situation uh, brings to them. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at the, uh, the liabilities uh, in question. Uh, in turn, we're starting with wrongful trading, and that's under Section 214 of the Insolvency Act. So a liquidator or an administrator has the power to pursue a director for wrongful trading. And I should explain here that a director includes not just um, those that are registered as directors at Companies House, but also those who uh, effectively are directors in all but name, um, as well as so-called shadow uh, directors, that those people who are um, exercising control over the company from from behind the scenes, you know, lurking in the shadows, hence the hence the term shadow directors. And it also covers uh, former directors, so past directors who've since resigned. Now, the liability will arise where a director knew or ought to have concluded that there was no reasonable prospect that the company would avoid going into insolvent liquidation um, or insolvent administration and that they failed to take every step to minimise the potential loss to the company's creditors. Now, when assessing the potential level of liability, the court will apply both uh, an objective and a subjective test. So the objective test is that a consideration will be given uh, to a person having both the general knowledge, skill and experience that may reasonably be expected of a person carrying out the same function as is carried out by the director. The subjective test then looks at the general knowledge, skill and experience of that relevant director 
and what they actually possess in terms of those skills, knowledge and experience. If the director is found liable, then the court may declare that person to make a contribution to the company's assets as the court thinks proper. And the quantum of uh, the compensation of the sum that they must pay is usually dictated by the increase in creditors claims uh, from when the director knew or, or ought to have known when the company was insolvent uh, or could not avoid liquidation or administration uh, up to when it eventually did enter into one of those processes. So during that period, it's the worsening of the company's financial position that the director could ultimately be uh, on the hook for making good. Um, furthermore, the court can um, award uh, or make a, a disqualification order uh, against the director for a period of up to 15 years. Now, there was some legislation, uh, I mentioned this uh, in last year's seminar, it only just come in, um, in the form of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance, uh, Governance Act of 2020, which was subsequently renewed by uh, various regulations, and it had the effect of suspending the operation of these rules relating to uh, wrongful trading. Um, so under the suspension, a court is required to assume when they're determining uh, the, the amount, if any, that a director um, should be ordered to contribute to the company's uh, assets as a result of them being found liable for wrongful trading, then um, they, they're um, required to assume that the director's not responsible for any worsening of the company's position um, or that of its creditors during two very specific periods. So the first period was the 1st of March of last year through to the 30th of September. Then there was a two month break uh, and then from the 26th of November to the 30th of June of this year. As I say, two month break, bit bizarre, I'm not sure if the government dropped the ball there um, and didn't get around to extending the 30th of September deadline, but there is this curious two month window when the suspension um, doesn't apply. Um, it doesn't apply to all companies. Um, there are specified um, exclusions, but I suspect for, for those, those of you watching directors of uh, companies, um, that would be caught by this uh, and for advisors watching again you you'll typically be dealing with companies that would be caught by uh, this um, exemption so uh, or suspension rather but uh, I pose the question whether it actually means very much in practice um, does it potentially provide uh, directors with a lifeline um, well arguably not and I'll explain why the, the wrongful trading provisions in the Insolvency Act effectively doubles up uh, on existing common law duties and those in the Companies Act that I talked about earlier. Um, now, as we saw, a director owes a duty to promote the success of the company, uh, primarily that's its shareholders, but when the company enters into its a dangerous financial position, the twilight zone, then those duties switch and to be, uh, to be owed in favour of, of the creditors. So uh, a director can continue uh, to be liable in respect of various of those common law and companies act duties um, that they owe. So in other words, what I'm saying is the suspension under this uh, act of parliament arguably um, will not limit um, directors potential personal liability if they did carry on trading during those two periods I mentioned. Um, I'd also add that the suspension, it, it only mitigates the the quantum of contribution that may be uh, required to be paid by the director, it doesn't necessarily uh, impact on the finding by the court of whether that person has been liable for wrongful trading. Um, so in other words, it, it can still mean that a person could be disqualified uh, as a director if they've been carrying on uh, wrongful trading during those periods. OK, the next one on the slide uh, is uh, fraudulent trading, uh, and I've heard this often described as uh, wrongful trading with teeth. Um, again, it's a liability can be imposed where a, a company suffers loss caused by the continuation of uh, the business with the intent to defraud. And, and, and the key difference here between wrongful and, and fraudulent trading is that intention element. Because it's criminal, because it's implicit, it, you, 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 we're looking at fraud, there has to be the, the so-called mens rea, the actual intention of committing the fraud here. So um, a liquidator or an administrator can bring a claim, um, but they've got to prove dishonesty involving moral blame uh, against anyone uh, who was knowingly party to the carrying on of the business with an intention to defraud. So that can include 
non-directors as well. And it's a subjective test that's applied. So it's only what the accused knew or uh, believed is actually relevant here. Um, and, and as a result, the standard of proof uh, is, is, is higher than uh, for wrongful trading claims. Um, if found liable, uh, the court may declare the person to make uh, such contribution to the company's assets as the court thinks proper. They can go further and make a disqualification order uh, of up to 15 years as well. And in really serious cases, as we'll see later, criminal proceedings can also uh, be uh, brought against that person. Then we come on to uh, misfeasance, which is under Section 212 of the Insolvency Act. And that just provides uh, a summary remedy uh, in a liquidation uh, against delinquent directors, um, not just current directors, by the way, but also former ones, as well as those who are directors in all but name. And it covers the situation where the, uh, the director has misapplied or retained or perhaps become accountable for any money or other property of the company uh, or been guilty of any misfeasance or breach of fiduciary or some other duty in relation to the company. So it, it, it's a bit of a catch-all provision, if I can put it in those terms. Um, and just to give you a few examples to, you know, as a flavour of, of what might constitute misfeasance, um, here's, here's a few for you. So the first is the, the misapplication of any money uh, or assets of the company. Um, secondly, a, a breach of a duty uh, of care, um, for example, negligence provided the, the duty of care is owed uh, to the company. Um, directors entering into transactions at an undervalue or preference transactions. I'll be talking about those in a moment. Um, and then it's at this point I want to introduce uh, bounce back loans and the potential misuse of those two. So just to recap, um, bounce back loan scheme was designed uh, to enable UK companies to access uh, finance very quickly during the pandemic. I understand that over one and a half million businesses uh, took out the facility before the scheme closed its doors um, early this year, 31st of March. It's a contract between the borrower uh, and the lender, so the obligations are actually owed to the uh, lender uh, to repay the loan. But sitting in the background, there is a guarantee in place between the lender and the British Business Bank. Now, Speaking to others in the insolvency community uh, recently, there is an expectation that when we start to see more insolvencies coming through, probably in the early part of next year, for the reasons I spoke about earlier, we're going to see incidences of fraud um, where bounce back loans uh, and, 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 and furloughing has, has been abused. And it's, it's just, just a sad fact of, of life um, that where a scheme is designed to help people, it's going to be abused somewhere along the line. So we are fully expecting there to be um, these sorts of matters um, and misfeasance, I would suggest, is, is probably the vehicle that will be used to attack the director to make good any, any losses. Um, the, the Insolvency Service recently gave some guidance to, uh, or published rather, via um, R3, um, R3, by the way, is the trade body responsible for representing insolvency practitioners, um, the professionals, so not just um, insolvency practitioners, but solicitors, agents and the like as well. Um, and they gave their their guidance and views on uh, on directors having used bounce back loans uh, on a reasonable basis to cover their living costs if they had no other means of uh, getting income uh, during the pandemic, you know, for example, if they weren't eligible for the furlough scheme. And, and this was particularly um, so where we're dealing with personal uh, service companies um, where the main day to day expenses um, have always been uh, for the director services in the company. And the insolvency service, their, their guidance, their view is that the situation would have to be judged on a case by case basis. You, you'd probably expect them to say that, but they went further and said that if a director um, had no other income at all because they weren't eligible for the furlough scheme um, and they used the bounce back monies um, to draw funds for their reasonable living expenses. After all, they would have had a family, potentially, you know, a lot of mortgages and, and other outgoings to pay. And if they carried on paying themselves to meet those expenses at a level that was the same or similar to how it was before the pandemic, um, then it, it would be difficult to, to criticise 
the director and, and for the insolvency service or insolvency practitioner to take action against that director, particularly um, if there was an economic benefit gained by keeping the, the company afloat. Um, but unsurprisingly, the insolvency service did add that um, it would be a different kettle of fish um, if the director had spent the, the £50,000 bounce back loan on, uh, on themselves uh, in a very short period of time, um, outstripping previous drawings. Uh, in that situation and in, in similar situations where um, you know the director uses the loan monies to buy a car or perhaps pay off a chunk of their mortgage, and believe me I think we are going to see examples of that coming through because as I say once the scheme is in place it will be abused. Um, in those instances then very much uh, action will be taken by the insolvency service and by uh, insolvency practitioners and as I said a few minutes ago it, it's misfeasance I suspect that will be used as the vehicle to bring those claims. So just going back finally to uh, finish what I was saying about misfeasance the various ingredients that need to be satisfied for a successful claim. Um, for a successful claim then the the, the applicant and that, that can be the insolvency practitioner or indeed a creditor has got to show loss to the the, the company caused by the the relevant breach of duty. Um, under the provision under section 212 of the Insolvency Act, then uh, the liquidator or a creditor, creditor can apply to the court uh, uh, for a court order compelling that individual director to um, repay, uh, restore or account for any misappropriated money or property uh, and with interest on top um, or contribute such sum as the court uh, considers is just that should be contributed to uh, the company's assets by way of compensation. There is a defence, uh, a statutory defence set out in the Companies Act, um, whereby the director can uh, seek relief from liability if they can show that uh, they acted honestly and reasonably, and the circumstances of the case mean that it's fair for them to be excused from liability. Um, but you won't be surprised to know that the courts don't tend to invoke that provision successfully where the director has caused the breach of their own doing and they've gained personally from, from that breach. And then just very briefly, I'll put three other uh, avoidable transactions that, that you know a director could uh, find themselves um, on the wrong end of, um, particularly when trading in the fog of, of, uh, of, of the twilight zone. It, it's easy for any of these to potentially um, crop up uh, with rash decision making. So they, they need to be borne in mind. So the first one on the screen is transactions at an undervalue. Pretty much says what it says on the tin there. It's fairly self-explanatory. It's quite a technical provision. There are time limits that apply as does the financial state of the company. But for the purposes of today, I'm talking here about transactions that uh, take place when the company's already insolvent um, in the period not long before its ultimate demise. Um, an administrator or a liquidator can apply to the court to restore the position to what it would have been in uh, if the company had not uh, entered into that transaction. Um, but the court won't make the order if it's satisfied that the company which entered into the transaction did so in good faith and for the purposes of carrying on its business. And furthermore, it did so at a time when there were reasonable grounds for believing that the transaction would benefit the company. Like I say, it's quite quite a technical provision. There are quite a few key ingredients that need to be satisfied. And there is that potential get out at the end there that I just explained. Preferences, again, you probably can hazard a guess at as what those mean. Essentially, a preference um, involves a company doing anything which puts uh, a creditor or a guarantor into a position which if the company went into insolvent liquidation, uh, will be better than if the, the position they'd be in if the thing had not been done in the first place. Uh, a quick example there, uh, let's say the director is a guarantor to um, a particular creditor, they may be in a personal guarantee and the creditor is owed a load of money by the company. The, the, the uh, director can see the writings on the wall for the business and he uses company monies to pay off that creditor with the effect of course that he's then extinguished his personal liability under the guarantee. He, he That's a preference, you know, fair and square. That sort of thing would always certainly be challenged. Um, as I say, I'm assuming for the, for the benefit of that example, we're talking about the period just leading up to the company going to liquidation. Um, what, what is important with preference claims, however, is that it's got to be uh, demonstrated that the company giving the preference 
was influenced in deciding to give it by a desire to produce the preferential outcome I've just given. So the desire to prefer element uh, is important to be shown if a preference claim is going to be successfully brought. Um, again, like transactions and under value, there are certain time limits that apply, as does the financial position of the company at the time of the transaction. Um, uh, but I'm talking here again at the period just before the company, uh, its ultimate demise. So the administrator or liquidator can apply to court to seek an order to restore the position uh, to, to what it would have been in had that preference transaction not occurred. There is a rebuttable presumption that the desire to prefer that I was speaking about a moment ago um, in the case of a person, uh, sorry, a preference to a person connected with the company, such as a director or an associate of the director, such as a the director's husband or, or, or wife or civil partner. Um, so it is rebuttable. It means that the director could furnish evidence to to rebut that, but otherwise uh, it, there is a presumption in favour of the uh, person bringing the claim there. So um, it, it's important the director can rebut that presumption if they're going to successfully defend that sort of a claim against them. And then very finally, we've got unfair, uh, unlawful dividends rather. And I see this a lot in practice for small owner managed businesses. It's quite often the case that they will be drawing monies from the business, either a set amount per month or perhaps ad hoc sums, round figure sums. Um, to meet their living expenses uh, and other outgoings. Um, and uh, what will often then happen is at the year end, the, the accountant will um, tot up those sums and uh, the company will then declare a dividend to mop up those sums and cancel out what the director's already drawn from the business. Now, that practice, um, it goes on, as I say, all the time uh, in small, small, typically family or, or owner managed businesses and, and in happier times when the company is solvent, probably not really a problem. I mean, there are technical problems with if it's not done correctly in the sense that there are certain hoops that have to be jumped through. But, as, you know, if the company is solvent, then no one's looking in on it and is unlikely to be a problem. Uh, I'm not suggesting for one minute you should be doing it like that. I'm just saying in practical terms, it's probably not that much of an issue where it becomes a problem, however, is when the company goes into liquidation or administration, because it's at that point that the authorities uh, will start to, to look at dividends. They'll be looking at uh, how those dividends were declared. They'll be looking at the financial position of the business. Um, did the company have distributor reserves? Did the director take due account of what was coming up on the horizon? Any contingent liabilities, perhaps, that should have been factored into their decision making uh, and, and the paperwork trail evidencing all of that. So unlawful dividends, um, Yes, they are very much something that are attacked and looked at by insolvency practitioners. Um, so be, be, be aware there. Right. Um, the third part of the, the presentation looks at uh, some practical tips then um, to try and help directors steer their way through this minefield and, and really help mitigate uh, the risks of personal liability. And they're up on the screen um, at the moment. So the first one, um, it's important that directors hold regular board meetings to discuss the company's financial position. Um, and that's even if you're the sole director. I know it sounds crazy, but um, it's important to document um, uh, and, and continue to have those uh, systematic um, moments of, of actually considering the financial position of the business. Um, it's important that when having those meetings, whether it's just on your own or with, with your fellow directors, that you have accurate, reliable and, and current um, financial information in front of you um, and that should include information on daily cash receipts uh, as well as um, cash flow forecasts and here's the really important bit uh, keep a record of those meetings when it was held where it was held who was there uh, what was discussed what what decisions were made and and why those decisions were made it's really important to keep that that, that contemporaneous record um, of that decision making process. And I would add here that the same applies um, for any other less formal decisions, because if you remember earlier at the start of the presentation, I said that that duty to promote the success of the company applies to all decisions that a director makes, not just those made at uh, board level for you know, formal um, circumstances, but also informal uh, decision making. Um, so keeping that contemporaneous record 
um, gives the director a fighting chance of being able to explain their conduct down the line, uh, which could be several years later, um, having to justify what they did years earlier um, uh, in terms of decision making about the company's finances, um, just justifying it to insolvency service, perhaps in the context of disqualification proceedings, justifying it to an insolvency practitioner who's coming after the director for a civil claim for, for, for money, um, you know, even, you know, criminal proceedings, um, perhaps. So standing up in court, having those documents to rely upon um, is really important. Um, the absence of those documents doesn't mean, of course, that you didn't turn your mind to those factors and have these discussions and make those decisions, but proving it is extremely difficult. And uh, uh, you'd be helping people like me uh, defend you uh, if you ever found yourself uh, in that position. Um, it makes my life an awful lot easier um, if I can turn to paperwork that was produced at the time uh, documenting um, those decisions. So another key uh, practical tip is monitoring uh, creditor pressure and that goes hand in hand with my next point which is maintaining good lines of communication with creditors, suppliers and other key stakeholders. Um, my best advice there is that honesty and transparency is, is the best policy um, and I'd like to hope that people were, uh, as we come out of the pandemic, were, were being honest and transparent with their uh, creditors um, because if they were, I suspect there would have been quite a degree of sympathy to a point at least um, because the pandemic obviously affected uh, pretty much everyone in different ways. But honesty and transparency um, is really important. Keep those lines of communications open. Um, and on a similar theme then, engage with other uh, key stakeholders and lenders, uh, and that includes the pension regulator uh, where appropriate. Um, directors and officers insurance, uh, ideally uh, have it in place. Um, make sure you're up to date with cover and with the premiums um, to have that in place should that need to be uh, called upon at a later date. Um, you've got to be careful with uh, an asset if you're looking to realise an asset to raise capital. Um, I can understand a, a, an urge that you may need to raise capital in those difficult times. Um, there's nothing wrong in principle with doing that, but all you've got to make sure is that it's not sold at an undervalue. So going back a few moments ago, I was talking about transaction undervalue. You've got to avoid that whole minefield uh, there. So keep uh, carry out some market research, uh, keep, keep a record of the value uh, of the asset, keep that safe because that decision making will be potentially revisited at a later date and you're going to need to have to justify why you sold that particular asset, uh, why you sold it for that amount and to that particular the third party. Um, and then if you do sell an asset, just be careful then what you do with the proceeds of that sale, which is my next point. Um, be careful making payments that could be construed as preferences Again, talked about that a moment ago, didn't I? Um, document the reasoning for uh, entering into transactions at an undervalue and preferences uh, which are outside the ordinary course of business so that you can uh, turn to that paperwork should you need to defend yourself at a later date. And if you are receiving sums on an account of uh, dividends, uh, I would suggest that you cease to draw such sums. Uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, if, if the company does enter a formal solvency procedure, um, you can bet that uh, action will be taken um, and, and those sums will be clawed back. And finally, uh, and I suppose you say, Kevin, you, you would say that, wouldn't you? And that is take and uh, importantly act upon uh, appropriate legal and financial advice. Speak to someone like myself, speak to an accountant, um, speak to an insolvency practitioner and ensure that you follow that advice through. Don't just cherry pick the bits of the advice that you like. Right, I said then we're going to look at the scary bit at the end, um, the failure to, to discharge the duties. And there are three main areas of, uh, of concern if, if, you, if you get it wrong. Um, let's start first then with action by the office holder. So the office holder, meaning the insolvency practitioner that's then dealing with the company in administration or liquidation. So they're under a, a statutory duty to investigate the affairs of the company, uh, as well as the conduct of its directors. And that's with a view to identifying uh, any claims that could be brought against the directors um, and or third parties to help swell the assets for the benefit of the company's creditors. And that could therefore result in uh, a monetary claim being brought uh, against the director. Um, 
you may think, well, I don't need to worry too much because my company uh, hasn't got any assets. So the uh, the office holder is not going to get paid. Um, so why would they bother coming after me sort of thing? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid you'd be wrong if that was your view, because um, for some time now, there have been various funding methods available to an insolvency practitioner. Uh, a conditional fee agreement, so-called no win, no fee. Those have been around for a long time now. Damages based agreements is another method of, of funding. And there's a whole industry now, huge industry, uh, third party litigation funding. So there are the tools at the disposal of the insolvency practitioner to, and they have the appetite, I have to say now, most have the appetite to take on a speculative claim where they know that they're not going to get paid a fee unless and until they make a successful claim. Um, so yeah, just because your company's not got any assets, don't think you're going to get off the hook, I'm afraid, uh, for, for any action. Um, and I'll just add there that since the 1st of October 2015, um, office holders can assign certain claims um, i.e. sell them to a third party who that third party would then pursue those claims. Um, examples are uh, wrongful and uh, fraudulent trading, transactions at an undervalue and uh, preference actions. So yeah, uh, those are the financial claims that an office holder could bring. Um, turning to non-financial claims, principally non-financial anyway, uh, disqualification proceedings. Now, um, Going back to the office holder, as well as looking into the affairs of the company and the conduct of the directors, they're under a duty to report to the authorities, the insolvency service, on the conduct um, of the directors. Um, and it's not just those who were directors at the date of the uh, insolvency, by the way, it's those that were uh, a director any time in the three years prior to the company entering. Uh, administration or liquidation. And that could then lead to an investigation by the insolvency service uh, and the threat or even the commencement of disqualification proceedings on the grounds that that person is unfit to be uh, concerned in the management of a company. If the director admits that misconduct uh, or, or a court finds them liable, uh, then they are banned from being a director uh, of a company. And in fact, the legislation goes further. They can't in any way, whether directly or indirectly, be involved uh, or concerned or take part in the promotion, formation or management of a company um, without without the court's permission. And that's for a period of between two and 15 years. So it's quite quite a penalty um, directly or indirectly be concerned or take part in the promotion, formation or management. So as I say, it's a very wide definition. Um, unless you get the court's permission and the period, as I say, the ban can be anywhere between two and 15 years. Now, unlike the civil claims that an office holder can bring, you can't just buy yourself out of these sorts of proceedings. Um, so usual commercial considerations, uh, they don't really apply here. Um, instead, it's all about whether the proceedings, um, including the terms upon which they are uh, settled or, or, or discontinued, are in the public interest. Uh, I suppose the only time that finances might be relevant is if you've got a deep pocket to afford good lawyers uh, who might be able to put up a good defence. But otherwise, it's not a case if you can buy yourself out of the claim. So if uh, discontinuance, if you can't persuade the Secretary of State to drop any uh, threatened or actual proceedings against you, then the only way to settle it is by agreeing what's called a disqualification undertaking um, and that, that would prevent the matter going the full distance to trial. And, and uh, an undertaking, just to explain uh, for those who don't know, it, it's simply an agreement uh, not to be a director of a company for uh, an agreed period of time and it actually has the same force as if the court made a disqualification order against the director. And um, Part of the undertaking process involves agreeing a set of agreed facts, um, undisputed facts about, about the particular misconduct. Um, I mentioned that this is largely a non-financial uh, consequence of misconduct. Uh, that's right, although since 2015, uh, compensation orders and undertakings can be made or agreed where the conduct in question has caused loss to one or more creditors of an insolvent company of which uh, that person has any, uh, at any time been a director. So there's got to be a link uh, between the misconduct and a financial loss. It's it's a relatively new provision, say 2015. Um, certainly in the early years, there's been there was very little, if any, uh, case law um, showing where it's been invoked. But there was 
the first case reported a couple of years ago in November, I think it was, of 2019. So I think we can expect to start to see more compensation orders going forward um, off the back of disqualification orders and undertakings being um, made and, and agreed. And then the other consequence uh, of, of um, disqualification is the publicity. Um, companies house maintain a register of disqualified directors. The insolvency service, they, they publish details as well for uh, up to three months after the, uh, the order or the undertaking given. And then and I'm sure you've seen this yourselves in, in newspapers uh, and online, local, uh, national trade press might pick up on the story if it's particularly um, uh, of interest to their readership. So yeah, publicity, that's probably not very nice. You know, the rest of it, you might be able to sort of think, well, I can keep that under the radar, but the publicity uh, may be very, very unwelcome. And then finally, um, criminal proceedings. And, and this is, as you'd expect, we're talking very serious cases here. So, for example, under Section 993 of the Companies Act 20, uh, 2006, um, a, a person who's knowingly party to fraudulent trading um, could face imprisonment of up to 10 years, um, a fine or, or indeed both. And a disqualification could also be made on top just to add, add to it. So, uh, in short, uh, a whole heap of misery um, is how I describe it, and uh, it would be best avoided um, if, if directors uh, seek to comply with their duties um, in the first place. So that was everything I was um, planning to say today. Um, tomorrow morning we'll be um, sending round a recording uh, to everyone that signed up for today's webinar. Um, we'll also be including a link to uh, a survey, a short feedback survey. You can see that it's on the screen now. We'd really appreciate um, if you could complete that so that we can make sure that our, um, our future webinars uh, are helpful to you. Um, as I said at the start, this is just one of a series of ongoing webinars that we've been running um, well for the last 18 months really, and they're gonna be continuing as you can see on the screen. The next one is on the 6th of October, and that's entitled um, Avoiding family court delays the collaborative way. So if that is of interest to you, please visit our website uh, or the uh, event bright page to sign up for that. Um, I don't know if we've had any uh, questions in. Um, we have, I'm seeing a nod there. Sarah? Yes, we've had a couple of questions come through. Uh, first one from Mike. Um, what is your view on a director's vulnerability to a breach of duty claim from a liquidator for making payments into an EBT scheme where HMRC might also be pursuing a separate claim themselves against the director for the same thing? Huh, I think I might know the uh, person asking that question. Um, that's a, a very, very good uh, and very technical question, Mike. Um, and uh, I, I know why he's particularly asking that question. Um, I think it might be better we, we discuss that one um, uh, off, off the uh, the webinar. Um, the the misfeasance provisions, as you, as you know yourself, uh, are very wide. They capture all sorts of um, activity, and um, they uh, are used very commonly by office holders to pursue um, delinquent directors. I, I use the term uh, catch-all provision, um, so they do mop up a lot of um, a breach of duty um, type scenarios. Um, so, um, depending on the facts, and, and, and it is very fact sensitive, and, and, and in some ways doing these questions it's quite difficult to give um, a full answer because it really does depend on the, um, the circumstances uh, as to whether you can identify a breach and, and, and loss to the company, then, then there could be a misfeasance claim there as well. Uh, any, any, any others, Sarah? Yeah, there's a question from Lisa. What are the most common mistakes first time directors make? Uh, very good question. Um, there are no um, formal qualifications that you are required to uh, undertake to become a, a director. Um, there, there are obviously qualifications out there that which you, which you can uh, seek to, to, to obtain, um, but you, you can become a director um, straight out of school and with absolutely no training or experience um, whatsoever. And as such, uh, it's very easy to trip yourselves up with uh, all sorts of things. And I think really the, the, the examples that I've, I've given um, today 
uh, of, of where you can go wrong, the sorts of claims that can be brought against you. Um, that, that's where directors are going to find it difficult. So um, where, where the finance, where the, the business is on the cusp of insolvency, um, there, there can be this fog. I talked about the fog of, of, of trading in the twilight zone, and it's very easy for rash decisions to be made about who you should be pay, paying. Um, uh, you know, maybe uh, assets being sold off that, that you haven't properly done your due diligence on to make sure that those assets are uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a proper value. Um, so I think those are very easy to trip yourselves up on. I think just taking advice at the right time is, is another point. I think directors, um, they might be they might be loath to do so, um, particularly as they, they're worried it's going to cause them to, to incur costs. Um, out of their own pocket. Um, but um, in my experience of advising directors, it's usually uh, money well spent if they uh, seek advice at the appropriate time. Um, and uh, that can help to avoid uh, problems down the line or, or at least mitigate um, any problems. Are there any other questions, Sarah? No, that's all for today. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Katie, as well, acting in the background. Um, if there are any further questions, um, uh, I would be very happy to, as I say, speak to people um, after the event uh, or, or, or by email. My details are on the screen um, right now. Um, so thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, uh, we uh, hope you found that useful. And uh, like I say, very happy to pick up uh, on any of the points I've raised today. Um, if you are that person, that first time director, by the way, um, feel free to, to give me a call and, and we can have a chat further. If there's anything in particular that um, is, is worrying you, um, be very happy to, to go through that in a bit more detail. Uh, but for now, uh, thanks again for joining us uh, and goodbye.